Hello historians and welcome back to another episode. Today we are continuing our deep dive into the life of King Henry VIII and his reign. This time we're focusing on the period between 1536 and 1537. This year, or 18 months, depending on how you want to look at it, was significant as this was the time when Henry was married to wife number three, Jane Seymour. History often portrays Jane as Henry's favourite wife and the one that he truly, deeply loved. However, I ain't fully sold on that. I think she was his favourite, yes, but I think the only reason she was his favourite was because she gave him a boy. You know, the boy that he spent decades longing for, the boy that both Catherine and Anne Boleyn could not provide him. I think also he was, she was potentially his favourite because they just hadn't been married long enough for her to annoy him properly, you know? And I do believe that if Jane had not given Henry the son and she had not died in childbirth, I think her story would be an entirely different one. As I said in the last video, towards the end of Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn, Jane had become Henry's mistress and was flaunting the king's affection. One key thing to note here is that Jane is often portrayed as meek and mild, but she played the same game that Anne played against Catherine. There are a lot of parallels between Jane and Anne's rise in the king's affections, such as flaunting the king's affection, taking precedence over the current queen and acting as if she was queen prior to marriage. The only difference was the king and his temperament, but Catherine and Anne were strong-headed women and in his old age, not that he was particularly old, but by Tudor standards he was, the king was becoming less tolerant of strong-willed women. Jane and her successors realised that in order to retain favour, they must adopt an adoring and submissive attitude. Anne Boleyn was beheaded on the 19th of May, 1536. Henry and Jane became engaged the day after. Henry wore white on both days. This was a sign of respect, as this was the colour of mourning in France. This, to me, is also more evidence that when Henry and Anne wore yellow for Catherine of Aragon's funeral and death, that they were doing it out of a sign of respect rather than trying to snub Catherine. As don't forget, yellow was also the colour of mourning for Spain. After Anne's death, Henry did not want to look at Elizabeth, his daughter that he had with Anne, so he had her taken to Hatfield House, a residence that Elizabeth would spend a lot of time at. Henry's relationship with his other daughter, Mary, was also really rocky, as Mary was adamant that her mother's marriage to Henry was legal, while Henry was adamant that he would not be on good grounds with his daughter, the Lady Mary, until she accepts the marriage was not legal and him as the head of the Church of England. Ten days after his engagement to Jane Seymour, Henry and Jane wed at Whitehall Palace. Henry's wedding gift to his wife was a gold cup designed by the royal painter Hans Holbein, and it was engraved with the couple's initials, which was entwined in a love knot. The cup also had the Queen's motto engraved in it. The cup unfortunately no longer exists, as it was melted down in 1629. Jane was then proclaimed Queen on the 4th of June. However... She was never coronated. This could have been down to the fact that there was a plague in London at the time and Henry was a massive germaphobe. Although after what happened to his brother catching the sweating sickness, I can understand this. Her coronation was planned for October, but it was cancelled due to the pilgrimage of grace and it might have also been because Henry had already had two wives, two wives that he had coronated and neither of those two wives had produced him a male heir, so it could have been the fact that Henry was waiting for Jane to prove herself before he spent the money on making her queen. In June came the Second Succession Act. This document made 
both Elizabeth and Mary illegitimate and downgraded from the princess to the lady. Although for Mary, this didn't really change much because she had been made the Lady Mary when Henry had married Anne Boleyn. But now, both Elizabeth and Mary were to be referred to as the ladies Elizabeth and Mary rather than princesses. Both Mary and Elizabeth were then put behind any children that Henry and Jane may have. It also stated that if Queen Jane failed to produce any issue with the king, the king was granted the power to appoint anyone he chose to be his lawful successor, and that included the issue of any other lawful wife. Also in the same month, Lady Mary gave in and offers her father her submission. She didn't really mean it though, but she just thought for an easier life she might as well. I mean, it was probably easier for her to have her father on side than to not have him on side. What was rather nice though is the fact that it seems Henry welcomed his daughter back into his life and was ready to play the loving father role. However, it's worth noting that he was extremely irritated at how long it took Mary to come to this conclusion. The 23rd of June was a sad day for King Henry, as his only surviving, albeit illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond and Somerset, died. The king reacted with a mixture of grief and denial, and was convinced that his witch of an ex-wife, Anne Boleyn, had given Henry Fitzroy a slow-releasing poison. So even beyond the grave, she is being accused of stuff she didn't do. So at this point in English history, Henry VIII had commissioned the dissolution of the monasteries. This was to help England's transition from a Catholic to a Protestant state, but it was mainly to fill the king's coffers, as the Catholic churches were renowned for being full of really expensive stuff. As a result, in the autumn of 1536, a revolt started called the Pilgrimage of Grace. The rebellion began with a riot in the town of Louth in Lincolnshire, where the inhabitants felt that the king had gone too far with his religious reforms. The army of people marched south, its leaders carrying banners depicting the five wounds of Christ, which is what gave the rebellion its name. They saw their causes nothing less than a crusade. They had hoped that they could convince the king to make amends with Rome and restore or leave the remaining monasteries alone. This was probably the peak in Jane's queenship, other than producing an heir, as she didn't really do much. In late October, the queen fell to her knees at court and begged Henry to restore some of the smaller monasteries, and she suggested that the rebellion was sent by God as he was not happy with Henry for ruining so many of the churches. Unsurprisingly, Henry was furious with his queen and her defiance. He reminded her that the last queen died as a result of too much meddling in politics. Jane listened to her husband's warning and never treaded that line again. This contributes to what we know or what we think we know about Jane being meek and mild. I just think the difference between Anne and Jane was that Jane was smart enough to hold her tongue when necessary. That December, Henry agreed to meet Robert Ask, the leader of the Pilgrimage of Grace, and accept his demands, one of which was that the Queen was to be crowned in York. With everything happening in London, the rest of the country would, at times, feel very disconnected, which is why the monarchy would go on procession of the country, just to show their faces every now and then. Henry's compliance brought peace to the country, ready for Christmas, even though Henry had no intention of actually following the demands through. After all, he was the king, not Robert Ask. Christmas was a cute time for the royal family. Henry and Mary's relationship improved, and Mary got on well with her stepmother. As a result, Mary managed to persuade her father to let Elizabeth join the family. Henry and Jane sat together at the table and Mary sat opposite Jane. Elizabeth was too young to join the adults, but it was noted that Henry played with his youngest daughter very affectionately. It's also at this time we find out that Henry had already chosen the name for his son and heir as he thought that Jane was pregnant, patting her belly, saying, 
Edward, Edward. I mean, chances are she'd probably just eaten a bit too much and was bloated. Henry didn't have to wait long as Jane announced that she was pregnant in April 1537 and the Queen craved quail eggs during her pregnancy. They were out of season, so Henry had to go to great lengths getting them for his Queen. They were shipped to England from Calais and from Flanders. On the 12th of October 1537, King Henry VIII was at Esther. Esther? Escher? Oh, I should really know how to say that. When his son and heir Edward was born, Edward was immediately given the title Duke of Cornwall, which is the customary dukedom that is given to heir to the throne, a bit like Prince of Wales. Jane had given birth to the couple's son at Hampton Court Palace. Interestingly enough, her bedroom is now used as a meeting room by the staff at the palace. Jane's sister-in-law, Lady Anne Stanhope, also gave birth to a boy named Edward in another room of the palace at the same time. Henry was still concerned about plague, so he had Edward's apartments washed with soap and swept daily. Three days later, the new prince was christened at the Chapel Royal in Hampton Court Palace. Cranmer, Norfolk, Suffolk and the Lady Mary were assigned as godparents, and Elizabeth was still in the procession, and she was carried by Queen Jane's brother, Edward Seymour. On the 23rd of October, Henry was due to return to Escher, Esther, Esther, eh, to hunt, but Jane had been ill since Edward's christening, and he could not find it in his heart to leave Jane in such a state. Some historians use this as evidence of a genuine love connection between these two. But in my personal opinion, I think Henry was more concerned about losing his prize baby maker. After all, he is on wife number three and she's the only one to provide a male heir. And if she can do it once, she can do it a second time. Henry remained at his wife's side throughout the evening and into the night. Jane died in her sleep the next day at Hampton Court Palace. And Henry just couldn't cope with mortality and he fled to Windsor Castle. I think being next to a dead body was just a bit too much for him. That meant that the Duke of Norfolk had to sort out the funeral arrangements. While at Windsor, Henry refused to see anyone. When Henry emerged from his isolation, his ministers nervously suggested a fourth marriage for the sake of the realm. He was in need of a spare, and Henry agreed. Henry himself, don't forget, was a spare, and his eldest son, Fitzroy, suddenly died in his late teens, so... Henry knew the importance of the spare. Edward himself was a baby and his life was not guaranteed, which Henry also witnessed with the birth of Henry, Duke of Cornwall in 1511. Jane was laid in state at the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace. The body was dressed in a robe of gold tissue with a crown on its head and some of the Queen's jewels. Jane was the only one of Henry's queens to die as queen and as such was buried at Windsor Castle. She received a royal funeral and would eventually be joined by her husband in 1547. We don't know how old Jane was when she died, but she had 29 ladies walking in procession behind her at the funeral, and the custom was to have the amount of ladies walking for each year that they were alive. So we can infer that she was 29 when she died, meaning she was likely born in 1507, 1508-ish. Henry wore black for three months after Jane's death. Jane, like Catherine Parr, has been noted as the wife slash queen that encouraged a family unit. This is evident in the Christmas that they shared in 1536. And if she had lived longer, I think she would have continued to mend the rift between the king and his children. Would she have had more children? We will never know. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at the life and reign of King Henry VIII and his third wife, Jane Seymour. In the next episode, we'll be looking at Henry's reign between the years of 1537 and 1540 and how he dealt with widowhood. If you did like this episode, please help in any way you can by subscribing or listening to another. But until then, have a wonderful day.